It's May 26th, 1828, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that a ragged and peculiar looking teenage boy was found wandering the streets of Nuremberg, Germany, with a note addressed to the captain of the local cavalry regiment. The note was postmarked from a place unknown on the Bavarian border, and its author claimed to have raised the boy in isolation for unexplained reasons which would intrigue Europe. That sounds a bit like the beginning of Paddington Bear, but the story <laughs> that this was more often compared to was Oliver Twist, because of the era, you know, this orphan who possibly came from aristocratic or certainly more established family kind of finding himself feral on the street it's actually of all of dickens's work nicholas nickleby which may have been directly inspired by this story the story of this young man casper hauser and the equivalent of the please look after this bear note that Paddington had in Caspar Hauser's case was, as Rebecca mentioned, this letter, or in fact two letters. And the first one, the main one that asks the commander of the local cavalry regiment to take him in, ends with this rather ominous thing that says, it would cost me my neck had I escorted Hauser to Nuremberg myself. So the implication was that whoever had written this thing and whoever had dropped this boy in Nuremberg felt that there was some threat involved. And I think that added to the intrigue. And the reason we're reliant on the notes that he had about his person is at this point, he couldn't really speak. He couldn't really walk either. He sort of had the gait of a toddler. And this apparently kind of 16-year-old-ish man, young man, was only able to say uh, two things. I want to be a soldier like my father, and I don't know. So the second note he had on his person was supposedly from his mother and it said that his name was Casper and that his father had been a cavalryman. Although, and this is sort of setting the scene for some of the later analysis, examination of the handwriting suggests that both notes were written by the same person. But yeah, certainly on initial examination by the police, they thought he was a feral child from the woods, which I just saw an account that said they assumed he was a feral child from the woods, but I assume that was like a, a more common <laughs> occurrence in those days. And so he was transferred to a tower room in Nuremberg Castle at the expense of the local authority, where he refused to eat or drink anything apart from bread and water. Anything else supposedly made him vomit. He appeared astonished by mirrors and candles. He was overwhelmed by loud noise. And all kinds of weird stuff about him then got reported as fact. Um, you know, Casper could detect a needle under a tablecloth. The odour of the graveyard sent him into fits. He couldn't hold metal, only wood. And you just got to look at this, this stuff now and just think, <laughs> guys, this is a sensational enough story as it is. The details are quite weird. It doesn't require this embellishment. He is not the Babadook. Uh, <laughs> that's how it was reported. Is he something supernatural? Um, as opposed to, you look at it now, from the 21st century, and it does seem to be this peculiarly kind of Teutonic brand of child abuse, where people lock their children away in rooms for years at a time. Well, certainly, uh, the first story that he told to the mayor of Nuremberg, though, he kept changing his story as he went along, but he said that he had spent his entire life in solitary confinement in a darkened cell. He gave the cell's dimensions as approximately two metres long by one metre wide and one and a half metres high, and he said he had only a straw bed to sleep on and for toys, two horses and a dog carved out of wood. And he claimed that he found rye bread and water next to his bed each morning, and at times the water would taste a bit bitter and drinking it would cause him to go into an even deeper sleep and then when he'd wake up the straw had been changed that was in his cell and his hair and nails had been cut. Yeah and you can see the, the, the holes in the narrative from the beginning because one of the things he initially claimed was that his mystery caretaker only made himself known at the very end of his captivity and he came in and showed Caspar how to write his name and how to recite the phrase I want to be a cavalryman as my father was but straight away you're thinking so Caspar's vocabulary was very stunted but he could certainly speak and read far more than could be conveyed in one encounter with another human and we know from the actual cases of documented feral children who are raised in isolation how stunted his development would have been I mean there's a famous case there was a girl called Jeannie who was raised in total isolation by an incredibly neglectful family and in her whole life, she never managed to get those powers of speech that Casper seemed to demonstrate pretty quickly. 
He becomes a ward of the town of Nuremberg, and he's funded by people who are genuinely interested in his story. And he goes into the care, first of all, of Gorg Dalmer, who was a teacher and amateur philosopher, who was interested in the idea of how he may be able to civilise this kid who had just turned up out of nowhere. And first of all, he starts giving him instructions in language, and then he gives him pen and ink and art materials. And Hauser actually starts doing these artworks that turn out to be quite beautiful. I don't know if you guys have seen them, but they're really Mm. quite prodigious in a very yes, short space of time. Suspiciously good. <laughs> oh, you think he, he wasn't doing suspiciously them? Suspiciously good at drawing for someone who's apparently never drawn before, yeah, doesn't okay, even know well, what a that. pen is. Yeah. <laughs> and at first, under the care of Dharma, he did seem to flourish, but then things started to get kind of weird. Like, Dharma noticed... Then things really started un- to get weird. Then things got weird. <laughs> Guy who well, turns up in just pantaloons with his initials embroidered on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dharma noticed that there was this un pleasant side to Casper. A lot of people had said, you know, that he was very gentle and humble, but there was also this other element to him, which was that he was a habitual liar. And so tension between Dalmer and his family and their ward, Casper, grew. And then suddenly... Casper was found in the Dalmer cellar with a razor slashed to his forehead. He claimed an intruder had inflicted it on him as he sat on the privy in the cellar and warned him he would, quote, die ere he leave Nuremberg. And so then he was moved to the house of a city official called Johann Bieberbach for his own protection. But sceptics claim that he must have inflicted the wound himself because the trail of blood very clearly went from the cellar to his bedroom, potentially to dispose of a razor, and then back (laughs) to the cellar to be discovered. And then once he's in the care of Biberback, he then has another suspicious accident, this time with a pistol. Uh, and it's also timed conveniently, as was the incident where he turned up in Dalmer's basement bleeding, where it occurred just after he felt he had been found out for lying and he was going to have to face the music for it. So then he has a run in with a pistol and it just seems very conveniently timed, just as a story of his is about to be found out. Because then there was an incident, wasn't there, where... He appeared to have an attempt on his life. He screamed the dark man. The dark man was the the terminology that he'd used for this chap who used to bring him bread and water. So perhaps was the person keeping him in captivity or perhaps was the person who brought him to Nuremberg working for the person who had him in captivity. And I suppose it plays into both narratives, doesn't it? That, that you know, either he's a fantasist and he's, he's coming up with these things to try and get him out of awkward spots or that actually the person who did drop him off has changed his mind on showing him mercy because he hadn't intended him to become a celebrity squawking yeah. about his childhood to every academic in town and had just wanted to give him his freedom and had come to try and kill him. Well, equally mysterious is his death. So one night in 1833, he burst into the door of his home, now in Anne's back, clutching his side and murmuring about how he was lured to the park by a stranger who then stabbed him in the side. And police then found this small violet purse at the place where Hauser said he had been stabbed. And within the purse was a penciled note that was written in Spiegelschrift or mirror writing. And it basically said more of this cryptic stuff about Hauser and his origins, but it had loads of spelling errors in it and it was folded into a triangle, which was a shape that Hauser was known to fold letters. Honestly, if you have a very particular way of folding letters, why fold the letter that you're trying to pass off as somebody else's into that exact same shape? But anyway, he eventually died of his wounds, which people later think he probably inflicted on himself and was intending this whole incident to be another moment where he gets attention and sympathy rather than actually dying of it. But that was his end. Yeah, because crucially, this all took place in the winter. And what was missing was a second set of footprints in the snow at the public gardens where he said he'd been stabbed by this mystery assailant. There was only one set of footprints there and they were his. However, there have been various forensic analyses over the years, but they haven't come to a firm conclusion. And that really reflects the Latin inscription on his grave, which reads, Here lies Caspar Hauser, riddle of his time. His birth was unknown, his death mysterious. Yeah, this was a sensation all across Europe in the 1800s. You can't really emphasise that enough. It's funny that we've kind of forgotten about it in this country because in the first century following his death, there were over 8,000 books written about him. He was a household name. Um, And although he isn't widely known in the English-speaking world now, it's still quite a big deal in Germany. There are poems about it, there's a novel, there's a play, Werner Herzog made a movie about it. Just to give a sense of the scale of the interest as well, one periodical that was published 50 years later, reflecting back on this era, said... 
For a quarter of a century, it is doubtful if any single individual in all Europe was so much discussed or awoke so great an interest and curiosity. And the question does still remain, you know, if he wasn't Caspar Hauser, feral boy, because I think we've raised a few of the sceptics' counterpoints to his story, but the who was he and what was his motivation for putting on such an extraordinary performance, which ended, if you believe this, in his self-inflicted death? Like, what would make him go so far? Was it money? Was it fame? Was he a fantasist who actually believed believed all of this stuff oh that was good rebecca i feel like a member of the jury you have <laughs> cast reasonable doubt you have made your final summation <laughs> tomorrow they're an anti-establishment band but they're basically promoting their shop sex love the show support the show patreon.com slash retrospectors part of the acast creator network